that is what the zombie is completely denied. It's eternal in that it doesn't, its flesh doesn't rot away. It will always be there, but it loses its eternal soul. Um, and so that is, that is what we're facing, I think, on a collective level. Welcome to Soror Mystica, a podcast exploring life's mysteries and magic through its symbols. I'm Mariana Lewis, an archetypal tarotist. And I'm astrologer Christina Farella. And just as the Soror Mystica guided the alchemist through his holy work, we hope to be your mystic sisters in these conversations, guiding you deeper into the symbolic life. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 22nd episode of Sora Mystica. Um, we are recording on Friday the 13th mm-hmm. in what we like to call spooky season. Mm-hmm. And we're here to discuss the symbol of the zombie or the mm-hmm. undead. Yeah. Um, and so it is going to be a creepy a nice time to be here with you all. <laughs> We're going to make sure it's nice. We're not going to creep you out too much. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so as always, um, we thank you for being here with us. And we are just, um, yeah, delighted to kind of, um, I think, be in this space again. It's been a little bit since we recorded, right? Yeah, We've it's been, been like- it's been a couple of weeks, I think. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to let people know that we actually have an option for all those uh, spiritual small businesses out there um, because we we both were up and comers in the spiritual small business world and um, you know worked really hard to get where we are in our businesses. Uh, so if you have a spiritual small business and you want to reach a broader audience, then we actually each week or each episode we invite someone to be our ad partner or sometimes two people, depending on, on, you know, who reaches out to us. So if you want to, if you like the podcast and you think that the people who listen to this podcast would be the ideal customer for you, or, you know, people who you would want to reach, then you can go to our website. Um, and there's a link on our website, so mysticapodcast.com that allows you to apply to be an ad partner and, um, just let us know what, what your business is and, uh, and that's that's a, a possibility for everybody. So definitely check that out because we love we we had the option, you know, with podcasts, you can kind of use Spotify or use Apple Podcasts to kind of do this ad stuff for you and and insert ads. And and Christina and I talked about it and we're like, we don't want to do that. We want to support the small businesses that really could use the support um, that really align with our values and we know that we align with theirs. So We love being able to offer that to the community. So go check that out. And now let's talk about scary stuff. Well, first we have to, I guess, talk about what we're reading. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about what we're reading. I feel like you and I are both in a space where we're reading multiple things at once. Yeah, I have eight books on on the I don't know what's (laughs) going on. I'm like, am I not able to focus or am I curious about a lot of things simultaneously? Like what's yeah, (laughs) what's going on here? It's both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm reading actively, I'm reading at least six books. And I get very like book fatigued. Like I'll I'll be into something and then be like I need a break and then I'll I'll reach for something else. Which it's like I'm comfortable with that. I like to have multiple things going, but I also have my Gemini Moon, so I feel like I'm interested in. Um, I can I can hold that space in my brain. I'm like, oh yeah, today is the day I'm going to read about this thing. But in specific, I guess um, I'm reading um, a book called The Other Side, which hmm. is an exploration of women, mystic artists. Um, and it is kind of like, it's kind of like part memoir. The, the author is, um, someone who used to be the editor of freeze magazine, which is Mm -hmm. like a fancy arts magazine. Um, so it's like part memoir and part this exploration of women mystics who made art. So there's, you know, like a chapter on, um, the spiritualist movement and seances, and there's a chapter on Helma of Clint and there's Mm -hmm. a chapter on Hildegard and like all of the kind of good, um, weird women that we like very much. Yeah. Make appearances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that's really fun. And then on the other end of things, well, it's not really that different. I found like a really solid, um, rendition of the story of the golden fleece it's definitely it's definitely written for like you know i'm gonna say not kids but it's like a a teenager book yeah it's kind of like YA, but it's Mm -hmm. it's old um but it's lovely because it's the story of the 
search for the golden fleece and then it kind of folds all of these other myths into it because That's so cool orpheus is one of the argonauts and he mm-hmm. they like use that as a vehicle for the telling of all these other stories that are important to the mythic canon so that's really fun that's so great. yeah those are two of the bunch and i'll just leave that there but yeah, yeah. what are, what are your favorites of what you're reading right now hmm. well i um i'm reading so many things i'd have to think about it for a second i just started the perfect heresy uh, I think it's called The Life and Death of the Medieval Cathars is the second part of that mm. because if anything's true about me, I like a niche medieval topic. Um, <laughs> I'm very into the Cathars. So they're like a group of heretics that believed wild things. I'm like so shocked. at the They believed that Jesus was a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> they believe that like the God of the Old Testament is the devil because Whoa. matter is evil like matter oh, is bad wow, and I so see. the god that created the universe is like did a bad thing mm-hmm. um but jesus comes from like the true god but he was not really incarnate so his like physical body was just a hallucination um Amazing. wild it's yeah. wild but like beside those like very intense things they also believed that like there's no real such thing as sin in the same way and like They didn't believe in marriage because there's no such thing as hierarchy and like everybody is their whole purpose is just emulate Christ in love and compassion and generosity and goodness. And so if you had, you know, a baby out of wedlock, they don't care. Not important. (laughs) Women could be priests basically. Like they, they had no kind of gender hierarchy in that way. So very interesting group of people. I really am loving this book. Um, and then I'm also reading uh, Stephen King's The Outsider. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is my first Stephen King novel. I have never read Stephen King before, but um, I'm liking it a lot. So that's great. It's my spooky season read. That's great. That's mm-hmm. great. So that actually mm-hmm. is a good segue into the undead. Um, so this is a this is a really broad topic to start with. Um, so I guess like you said that you haven't really seen any zombie movies. No, this is something that we have, I have made fun of myself about before <laughs> on this pod, <laughs> but, um, the, um, yeah, I've never seen a zombie movie and I don't think it matters though. I think that this is an interesting symbol nonetheless, um, yeah. because we live in a moment that is really like chock full of like seeming life. But mm-hmm. I know that a lot of us feel as though we either don't feel like we're fully living or we encounter <laughs> others or have experiences with other people where it's not really clear um, what like what life is going on here. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think yeah. that – so I wanted to do this episode a lot because um, – I, I'm not like obsessed with zombies, but I, I enjoy a zombie movie. I enjoy a zombie thing. My husband and I watched the entirety of The Walking Dead. <laughs> um, we did not watch the spinoff. <laughs> We're not that hardcore. But, you know, we've watched pretty much every zombie movie that's out there. Um, and we actually just two days uh, ago, we watched the um, Dawn of the Dead, which we haven't watched before. So we're, we're hardcore um, in, in, I guess our zombie appreciation. And Mm -hmm. every time I watch one of these movies, I'm like, what is this about? What is this really about? You know, and it, it just digs at me so much. And I've spent like a lot of years actually contemplating what the symbolic, what the symbolism of the zombie or the undead is. Because if we look at like, the, the um, movies in the media that has come out around this these things, it's intensified to such a degree in the last 20 years. You know, we have movies like Dawn of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead in the late 70s. Um, it, it was there. And then every now and then there'd be a zombie that, you know, is in something. But since like the mid, early, early 2000s, just zombie movie upon zombie movie. And it's like, why are we so obsessed with this? What does this say about the collective unconscious? Um, Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that certainly Jung said is like, you know, the, when we don't totally know what's going on in the collective unconscious, we project it outwards and we find it in other things. And so then we see the media, right. That, that kind of holds that, that 
thing for us that we don't totally have awareness of in ourselves. So I've been pondering this a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm really glad that we're going to explore it today. And I know you're going to have a lot of similar thoughts to me. Um, So I think that what we can kind of start with is like a description of like what what the zombie is. Yeah, take take us into the land of the zombie in particular, and then mm-hmm. we'll kind of branch out from there. Well, as we were saying before we we jumped on, there's not like there's not like a long mythological history of zombies. It's actually something that has kind of been born out of the collective unconscious, specifically in the last like 200 years. It's kind of newer. The one reference that we have that everybody uses to point to like its its more ancient origins is that that line from, I don't know what it exactly is, but Ishtar. In Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. Is it in the Epic of Gilgamesh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Where Ishtar says, you know, if you don't open the gates for me, then I will raise the dead and have them consume you. Mm -hmm. And so we have that that one reference, um, very ancient, but we don't have it. It's not really something that comes up in, in, um, you know, Greek mythology or Egyptian mythology that we have like specifically a creature who is undead and then goes and, and kind of attacks or consumes. So the zombie, as we think of it today is really, um, it's a living being that was once alive human, um, and was bitten or killed or something happens, um, that it dies and then it returns from the dead. And then oftentimes it will then seek to consume other humans. Um, and that's a very important um, thing that we can add on to it, especially in the modern understanding of the zombie. I don't know if we that was always the case, the zombie, as it was kind of talked about 200 years ago. Before we get like into the idea of the zombie in, in our con- contemporary media, we need to talk about the origins of the zombie as we know it. And the word zombie comes from Haitian voodoo um, or Haitian Creole and from the, the voodoo religion. I, uh, I actually took a class in college called religions of the diaspora, I think. And it was like, uh, it was like a class devoted to religions that popped up from the African diaspora, which was like just absolutely amazing class. I loved Mm -hmm. it so much. And so, you know, this idea of the zombie kind of comes from, it's not an originally African idea necessarily, but it was specific in Haiti because there was a lot of magic practice that kind of happened um, with the development of voodoo. And so there was spells or magical work of some kind, witchcraft of some kind that they would say they would raise the dead. And, and so it became like a big legend that you know, this was something that happened in Haiti. I did some research and I was reading this article from The Atlantic and they uh, they were talking a little bit more about the origins of that or why that belief, where that came from. And at least they claim in this article that there was this idea that in, because um, all these, these uh, Africans are brought over to Haiti and uh, forced into slavery and they were worked to the point of death. They were just overworked to the point where they would die very, very quickly. And so, of course, there were a lot of these people who wanted to commit suicide, I mean, who did commit suicide. And the the idea for them was that if they were to die naturally, then they would be able to return to Guinea, to Africa, to their homeland, like spiritually, right? And if they took their own life, then they would be cursed to stay in Hispaniola at the time before it was really Haiti. And so they would not be able to have that release and that return. And so there was you know, a shame. And there's like a pressure to like, don't, don't take your own life because then you'll be cursed and you'll be stuck here. And in that article from the Atlantic, they kind of say, this is sort of where it originates from to some extent that they would be cursed to be like these walking undead, like spirits. They'd be cursed to just stay here and, and wander the land looking for something that they'll never find. So it's extremely sad um, Mm -hmm. and extremely, it's a lot of grief in that, in that, those origins of it. Um, But it, there's a lot of references um, from about this idea of the zombie from Haiti um, and how it came over to the the U.S. You know, um, and then we kind of forgot about it for I don't know 100 years or so, or it wasn't really something that was discussed often. And then it was kind of reclaimed in the late 70s when they started creating horror movies, and horror was more of a genre of of film. Um, and then we have the rise of the zombie in American culture. 
So that's our little zombie history lesson. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm think, sure there's a lot more to it too, but it's just a little taste. No, it's interesting that it um, is a relatively contemporary um, idea or or trope because I think that as our society has modernized, whether you know it's um, you know creating industry or creating great metropolises or really deepening capitalism's reach um, Mm -hmm. globally, Mm -hmm. it's kind of gone hand in hand with this feeling that we're losing a connection to life. And something that just popped into my brain um, is that I think that, you know, you could think of um, a poem like T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland as a kind of um, expression in part uh, it's it's a reaction to the atrocities of war yeah. um, and the kind of half dead state that a lot of people found themselves in either recovering from, you know, bombings in Europe or um, mourning, you know, the life that they were no longer able to have because of that conflict. So yeah. it's something that seems to kind of come and, you know, this, the history that you just shared of, um, you know, the cruelties of slavery. Um, yeah you know, and the kind of stripping away of human essence and that becoming a really magnified trope in the collective unconscious mm-hmm. going hand in hand with modernization. So I think that that's, that's what interests me about this is like, yeah. you know, the more developed so-called the world becomes, the more there is the potential for something to feel like it's being kind of denuded of its spirit or its essence. Um yeah. And that's really alarming because we can't do anything to stop that. So bringing consciousness to that feeling of, you know, I mean, there are a lot of us that feel like we walk through our days feeling like a quote zombie because Mm -hmm. we're just like so overstimulated or so overwhelmed or so, you know, depressed or anxious or just uninspired. Um, So there is this really interesting emotional quality that goes along with that, with the zombie or the undead, um, a feeling of grief and the loss of something that we can't recover. Right. So, yeah. I love mm-hmm. that. That's so put so beautifully. I think that, you know, we've talked about what the zombie is and like, it's kind of more literal definitions. If we think about it in a more symbolic way, it is the being that has lost its consciousness. Right. And that, that is kind of the horror of the zombie in, in uh, Dawn of the Dead, which I just watched. In the beginning, um, they have this, it kind of just starts with, um, they're in this newsroom and there's these newscasters who are trying to say, this is what's going on and what are we going to do about it? They have no explanation of, of understanding how this happened or where we got there. It's just kind of like starting right in the middle. And um, they there's this expert that they're interviewing And the expert says, if you see one of these things, kill it, run from it. It is no longer your brother, sister, husband, whatever. It is, it is no longer a person. And then all the people in the newsroom are like yelling at him and cursing him. Like how we can't give up on them. We have to find a cure. Like there's, there's gotta be something to reverse this. They're not totally gone. Um, and there's this idea that, that the, 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 being the form is present. It looks present. And and yet the consciousness is entirely divorced from it. And so when we think about that in other terms, the soul is gone. Mm -hmm. It is a body that has lost soul. Uh, The brain still works. And all these zombie things are always like, shoot him in the head, (laughs) chop off the, chop off the head, get the brain stem, because that's, that's what disconnects the actual like control center and the, and the muscle function, because it's literally just a being it's like a machine that's just moving around with this this impulse and that's another layer to the zombie too of this this um kind of animalistic impulse that it's following um that is sort of like it's like why does it why would it they they always uh have scenes where they'll just like dig a hole and it'll just fall into the hole because it has to walk towards the the guy that it's trying to eat you know and it has no sense of awareness or choice it is just this kind of animal instinct it has to abide. So that's that's sort of what, you know, starting off with the symbol, that's the main essence of it, this loss of consciousness. And then there's so much to explore there about what is that in the collective 
unconscious? Where is that loss of consciousness? Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't zombies eat brains? Isn't that yeah, like a lot? Thing? Some some of them eat brains. Some of them just eat people. They just <laughs> <Good>. eat you, <laughs> and that's interesting too. Why is it people mm-hmm. like they don't usually? Some of these things they like don't eat a cow. You can give them a cow, they won't eat it. It's like they have to eat people specifically, right. and they have to eat a conscious person who's yes, not they don't eat a other zombies. zombie mm-hmm. right so it's a it's the zombification it's like nourished by consciousness it consumes consciousness or it consumes alertness or awareness or, or something like that so mm-hmm. I think that's significant in the cultural um, kind of milieu mm-hmm. it's like you know again we just keep saying that um, or I feel like I keep saying this is an expression of the way that we are made to feel when we live lives that are not um, fulfilling or that we yeah. live lives that feel like their essence has been taken from us unceremoniously. And mm-hmm. um, we don't get to, you know, we feel like, I think that, you know, the zombie and consumption is an interesting idea to yes. kind of play with. Yeah. So I have, um, I have a quote um, from Jung. So when we're talking about consumption to consume, you know, it's something that we, we take in, but at the same time, it's something then that is, is like destroyed, right? Mm -hmm. Like when something, when we're consumed by something, we kind of lose our power in it. And this, um, really is something that Jung talked about a lot, especially in his later writings, in The Undiscovered Self, that was the first book I ever read by Jung. It's a short book. It's like 115, 130 pages, something like that. And I found it in my grandfather's library. And I picked, I found all the Jung books in the library, but I picked that one because it was the smallest. And it's probably really good that that was the first one I read because all the other things would have been way too dense and way over my mm-hmm. head to read. But this, The Undiscovered Self, I cannot recommend it enough. Because it is, it is designed to be very readable and for like, you know, it's not highly psychological, but it is completely about the loss of individuality in the mass. How in this modern state of the world, you know, we lose our sense of self. We lose what it is to individuate because we are consumed by mass consciousness. Um, so I have this kind of long quote from the Undiscovered Self, but it's really worth it. So Jung writes, the goal and meaning of individual life, which is the only real life, no longer lie in the individual development, but in the policy of the state, which is thrust upon the individual from outside and consists in the execution of an abstract idea, which ultimately tends to attract all life to itself. The individual is increasingly deprived of the moral decision as to how he should live his own life and is instead ruled, fed, clothed, and educated as a social unit, accommodated in the appropriate housing unit, and amused in accordance with the standards that give pleasure and satisfaction to the masses. So that is a really good summary of what that book is. And um, yeah, it's it's like (laughs) borderline Marxist in in some moments, but that's okay, because Mm -hmm. it's a psychological evaluation of how we lose our individuality. And that's not to say that, you know, there isn't we don't have a need to to have mass protection and mass kind of experience. Um, you know, the state is not entirely evil all the time. To some people, it might be. In some places, it, it might be. <laughs> I think that it, it, you know, we're not to get too political, but like, I think that there's there's real service in the state being able to protect and offer you know, offer healthcare and offer ways for that. We don't have to make all these decisions ourselves all the time. There is like a unit and experience that's supposed to help and protect and serve us. Does it do that? No, but it's supposed to, that's the point. So we're not, you know, the point is not like to really like say there, we should not have government or there's no state. That's not the issue of it. At least that's not Jung's issue. Jung's issue is more like the idea that we all have to adhere to the state consciousness, to the state's understanding of this is what you are, this is what you do, this is how life should go. This is the clothes you should wear. This is the places that you should live. This is the food you should eat. It's it's very, um, we, we lose our individuality and our freedom. And in a psychological sense, 
that means that we do not have that liberty to individuate. We do not, as he says, the individual is increasingly deprived of the moral decision as to how he should live his own life. Mm -hmm. And that is something I feel like is really attached to what is going on in the collective unconscious about the zombie uh, you know, obsession is that we see ourselves in this uh, loss of ability to decide how we live our own life. And we all just kind of become this group that adheres to, you know, this is, this is the way life needs to be lived. This is what we expect of you. Um, this is how you, you kind of soften and, and mute yourself in order to not not stand out, right? Like in zombie movies, you cannot show that you're conscious. They're always like, you know, hiding behind things. There's this one really, really gross scene in The Walking Dead. <laughs> you're going to love it. Where the, one of the things they say is like, the zombies can smell people, right? They can smell that they're conscious living people, right? So what they do to like get through, they're trying to move through the city and the z city is just clogged with zombies. So they kill all these zombies and then they like make a juice out of their body and Ew. blood and then they pour it all over themselves. No, no, <laughs> this is stupid. No, <laughs> I have no tolerance for this whatsoever. It was, it was a really bad scene, <laughs> but they like just like coat themselves to be disguised. Um, but like the idea is that like, we, we don't want our individuality to stand out. We don't mm -hmm. want to show I'm conscious and I see myself and I have my individual thoughts and I can go against the mold and I can, you know, I can, I can be my own person. That is not that tolerable um, in the state. So I think that that's, that's something that we can definitely hold as one of the symbolic la layers of the zombie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that makes total sense. And um, I do think that it's something that we should be aware of that, you know, it's easy because we've been in such a, a stressful, um, like social dynamic for so many years now, honestly, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's the pandemic or politics or, mm -hmm. you know, just like the general tone of our cultural kind of structure, the, the tone of our discourse it's increasingly overwhelming to people and it's increasingly tempting to check out. Mm -hmm. And I think that in that checking out, we kind of lull ourselves into a kind of like coma of consumption. And, yeah. you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's like, it's really silly, but like in the Simpsons when Homer like sees a donut and he kind of, like, his brain goes offline <laughs> yeah. and he's just like hypnotized by the donut or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And then he comes back. It's like that. I think that there's this kind of, um, <laughs> This sense of which uh, the the kind of quick hit of dopamine or the yep. quick kind of fix um, feels like a solution, but increasingly we realize that it's not the solution. And without that kind of turn inward and having awareness and the ability to reflect on and relocate the self in this very confusing world, we wind up running the risk of kind of... Um, walking through our lives feeling like we're not living. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, if anybody's listening to this and you're struggling with depression or you're struggling with, um, you know, difficult situations, I'm not saying just look within and you'll be fine. Like we mm -hmm. live in a world yeah. that's basically designed to kind of mollify us and make yeah. us feel like we don't have um, the ability to change anything or to effectively yeah. do anything. And so it's not, it's not our fault. Um, but if mm -hmm. there's like a glimmer of, of energy in thinking about this symbol or the experience of being zombified or feeling undead, it is that we have the opportunity to maybe reclaim some of that life force. It's, it's like in the myths, you know, for example, we have the, the Chiron, you know, story where Chiron, the centaur healer suffers deeply and he can heal other people's wounds, but he can't heal his own. And eventually mm -hmm. he has to sacrifice his life to get yeah. relief. Yeah. When we talk about Chiron in astrology or in mythology as an example of a, you know, a, a story of transformation, we're not saying because Chiron never made it out of his wounding, you too will never make it out. Like we have mm -hmm. these stories and these symbols to say, okay, here's one version of experience. We can work with that with intention 
and then do something else. We can make a choice. We can yeah. hold it differently in our minds. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's also why it's important to be aware of what it means to feel zombified or mm-hmm. where that's coming from within you. So I love that Jung quote of just, you know, um, and this idea of the loss of connection to the soul, which is mm-hmm. definitely something that we experience. Yeah. And part of the reason why we care about what we care about so much um, yeah. because we want to reactivate these um, these symbols, these ideas for people. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you, if you want to get galvanized <laughs> to be anti <laughs> – anti-mass consciousness read that book it was it was it's really good it's not like extremely radical so don't worry it's it's not saying anything we don't know it was written like 1957 Mm -hmm. um but it's it's really it puts into terms things that like i had never thought in those ways before and then i read that and i was like oh my god this is why i'm so weird (laughs) it's because i resist i resist and i had no aware awareness that i was resisting falling into mass consciousness to the point where I never read Animorphs as a kid because everyone else did. I didn't read that either. Yeah. Why was everyone reading Animorphs? <laughs> it was good apparently. I don't know, but I, I don't was believe like, it. if everyone's <laughs> liking it, why should I have to read it? <laughs> I was like, I, I can't, like I can't because I, I, people just fall into what they're told. And I have this like really angry Martian thing that comes over me when people just start doing something. Anyway, the one, I, I'm the one book thing. series that I tried to read that everyone else was reading was Goosebumps, and it gave me yeah. such bad nightmares that my parents took my Goosebumps books away, and I wasn't allowed to read Goosebumps anymore. So, well, <laughs> this may be the origin of your your horror aversion. <laughs> um, it's so funny. Yeah, I didn't like I didn't like Goosebumps. I, I ever read, did you ever read the the probably not, but there's like a book of like what is it? stories to tell in the dark oh yeah like the girl with the green ribbon around her neck thing. yeah is that... those are horrifying i like that yeah i those like those are good though those are like very like po what po- yes. is that how you yeah. would make that po-esque po-esque yeah, po-like. yeah very much mm-hmm. um but yeah so um i think that that's that's all really powerful and, and to go back to this um you know idea of being fed something the idea of consumerism is really like if we try to find the origins of what is the thing in the collective unconscious that is turning us off and we we go back to even the time period in which the zombie became an archetype or a symbol that was really active. Um, it was in this post-enlightenment period where um, uh, capitalism was really coming into being. And I think that, you know, we all talk about this and just kind of think of like of it as like a modern thing, but capitalism is a new concept for the mm-hmm. most part. It's mm-hmm. only a few hundred years old. People always talk about it like this is the way it is. It can never be different. It's right. like, mm-hmm. yeah, we don't want to go back to feudalism. <laughs> but we <laughs> but kind of have. We, yeah, it's a like little. disguised as capitalism. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but mm-hmm. like it's it's not the only way. It is a fairly new experience in, in the human legacy. Um, and with capitalism comes the need for consumerism. We have to have need or else the capitalist structure does not mm-hmm. function at all. Mm-hmm. And so that is why we have fast fashion is that, and that is why we have 10,000 options of what kind of coffee you want mm-hmm. because there is, there is no method of growth if there is not need. And, and most people don't have the level of need that we're told we have, right? Like I um, – we have – my, my husband and I are going to move soon and I'm thinking about furniture and I'm like, we should get a new bed frame. We should get this, this, this. And I had to stop myself for a second. And I was like, all these things are functional and great. Why do I need a new version? And then I'm also disappointed because I'm like, but I want that. <laughs> like I want a new bed frame. I've had it for 10 years and I deserve it. And this is like the, the thing that we all get stuck in, this consumerist quandary of I don't actually have need, but I'm told by society that I can create need for myself and I can allow myself that need. And I probably will get a new bed frame because I haven't had a new one in, in 10 years and um, we might get a different bed size or something like that. And I'm not going to like feel terribly guilty about it. But I think that this is this idea of the consumerism is part is I would be very, uh, I really believe it's part of the zombie complex that we're thinking about mm-hmm. in the Dawn of the Dead in um George Romero was the director and writer of that. I think it's no accident um, that the whole plot, most of the movie takes place in a mall 
they escape. They're like, oh, we got to get out of here. Everybody's dying. Uh, it's crazy. Where are we going to go? The mall is the best place to go because what do they have? Everything. They have everything. They have food. They have beds. They have clothes. They have all the things that we can need. Um, and so they just have this this kind of um, insular experience where they're there and just enjoying consuming and at the same time, there's all these zombies around them trying to consume them. Mm. And the mall, when they first get there, is full of zombies, right? And they do this work of clearing them out. And they ask at some point when they first get there, why are all these zombies in the mall? Why did they all come to the mall? And they say there is, there's this instinct in the brain to just go do what you always do and to do the thing that you know. And the the zombie instinct does not it can't like pause itself and just say, what, why am I going this way? And so they all gravitated towards the mall because they all spent their life going to the mall over and over and over again. <laughs> That's um, so depressing. <laughs> it's so depressing. And not to spoil anything, I guess spoilers jump ahead a minute or something, but like, yeah, it doesn't end well for them, right? Like being in a mall is great, but they can't stay there forever. Um, they, they have, they end up like, you know, failing at like, they're like, we're going to live here forever. It's perfect. And it, it's not, it's absolutely not. And so, um, this, this, uh, idea of the consumerism or being consumed by the zombie, the spread of this idea of, we have to want, we have to need, we have to be voracious. And in that voracious hunger for stuff and for growth and for money and for whatever that is, has nothing to do with our personal individuation, our sense of soul. It's nothing to do with who we really are. It's completely external. We lose ourselves and we forget who we are. And that is, we're separated from it. We're separated from that clear consciousness of self-development. So I think, I don't think that that's the only way of looking at it, but I, I think that that's an important one um, for mm -hmm. today. Yeah. I mean, the issue is that we're told that consuming more will make us feel happier or better or mm -hmm. more beautiful or more important. Um, like we're told that status comes from the kind of car we drive or how big yep. our home is. And ultimately, you know, we all know people who have everything that you could seem like you could possibly want and they're still not happy. And mm -hmm. that's because we're fed this kind of calorie-less nourishment. It has yes. no nutritional value whatsoever. Yep. And so, you know, we can use that as a, a reminder that, yeah, the mall is not going to fit. A little retail therapy never hurts anybody, but mm -hmm. the mall is not going to solve your actual soul issue, which requires um, contemplation uh, and, and all kinds of, um, you know, creative explorations, um, whatever, whatever kind of yeah. things that we need to do. We need to find that inner spark mm -hmm. rather than um, look outwards and try to say, you know, this new skirt will save my life now. Mm -hmm. Well, I sometimes, am, sometimes, sometimes I, I skirt say, might actually really, really do a lot for your, your I had health. a really ridiculous phase in my twenties where I was just like, just doing that thing where I was dyeing my hair, all the colors of the rainbow, uh -huh. like compulsively though. Mm -hmm. And like, it wound up becoming like a bleach disaster and I had to cut all my hair off. This is no. before I, this is like right before I met you. Um, yeah, I was applying for grad school and I was doing this, mm -hmm. but I had like hot pink, hot purple, blue. I had hot like, pink hair for a hot yeah, second. Mm -hmm. It was a thing. And I was just mm -hmm. like this. Very 2016. <laughs> it was very, yeah, this was 2015. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was not, it was not doing it. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> but we do tell, like there are these symbolic things, you know, I don't want to say I'm not, I, I'm not a, uh, a purist. Um, I, I love to experiment with things that might make me feel better. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that at the end of the day, that's fine to have, but the real nourishment comes from something else. That's yeah. Deeper. It's not to say that we cannot have things. That's not at all the point. Yeah. I mean, look at my bookshelf. I'm never going to stop buying books, ridiculous amounts of books, <laughs> but it's about understanding what are we actually trying to feed and mm -hmm. what are we being distracted from? What is society, the state, the world distracting us from. Mm -hmm. And I think that this goes to um, the, there's a couple other things that I want to hit like and talk about with the zombie or the, the undead. One of them is that often in these stories, the entire world is gone and obliterated and destroyed. And then often a lot of the newer iterations of it, like in The Last of Us, for example, nature returns. 
And so I think that there's a layer of this too, of how we're destroying ourselves. We are, we are destroying ourselves and it is spreading. And I think that there is an ecological component to why it's so potent today um, because we are all just, there is a, an aversion to our animal nature that is wanting, wanting, wanting that we know is also completely harmful to the world. And so that becomes like exaggerated in these, these stories of the undead and the zombie and, um, and then, but things are like better for everything else, but people, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like Mm -hmm. in a lot of these, not all of them. And that's like, we can have a whole episode and we probably will on the archetype of the apocalypse. Um, but, but the zombie apocalypse thing does come up together a lot. And I really do think that that is a component to it for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the point of human life if it is just destroying that which nurtures it? And Mm -hmm. that's a huge question. And I think that um, astrologically, that's been a huge takeaway of Uranus and its transit through the sign Taurus, which is an earth sign ruled by Venus. And we have seen, obviously, there have been many ecological disasters for as long as we've been like drilling for oil, but Mm -hmm. we've seen um, a lot of kind of upsurge in awareness and coverage and protest about like the economic, I mean, not economic, uh, environmental, ecological disasters that we are living through and moving towards. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that that question of like, you know, what happens when you take humans out of the equation, (laughs) nature returns, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is, it reminds us too of... um, our smallness, right? Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Our inconsequentialness. It's I, mm-hmm. I love I love that in um in these zombie things. It's just like you see someone that you fall in love with in the movie or a character in a TV show, and you're like, oh, they have to survive, they have to survive. And then always they're like, and now they're a zombie, and you're like, how? <laughs> no, but it's also <laughs> and then they just they just disappear into the mass, right? They lose their consequential consequentiality is that a word Mm -hmm. um there's another thought i had when i was thinking about this this uh discussion and i kind of had the thought of the loss of religion and how that might kind of be a part of this too because not that we need religion and i know that a lot of people are anti-religion or just have problems with it and i totally understand but when when i talk about religion i think of it as a container in which we can freely and openly and actively uh, seek the spiritual, mm-hmm. seek that that space of divine meaning or or depth, um, and in in the last like two hundred years, we very much lost um, the like the idea that there is an afterlife that that we work because that was what our our you know we've had in the Western world is like in the Christian world you work really hard and you then do all the right things and you go to heaven and you are so rewarded. And so the physical body is really not important. You know, you, you die at 32, whatever, that's okay because you're going to heaven. So it doesn't really matter. Like everything's fine. Like the cathars, right? Yeah. Like the body is not real. The cathars also believe in, in, uh, uh, what is it called? When you come back to life. Reincarnation. Reincarnation. Mm-hmm. That's wild. Anyway, yeah. that's beside the point. But we, we, I, the idea is that we go to heaven and so the physical world doesn't matter. And so we've lost that idea of heaven in the same way. A lot of people question that. A lot of people don't know what they believe in this spiritual sense. And so I think that there is a level of the zombie too that is this confrontation with like, are, are, are we meaningless? Are we just flesh bubbles <laughs> on the mm-hmm. planet that we die and then we just lose consciousness and our consciousness goes nowhere? And so we see that also in the idea of the zombie just kind of being bitten, dying, and just being nothing. Yes. It doesn't mm-hmm. go anywhere. It doesn't get that that freedom, sort of like going back to that those Haitian roots. Like they just wander. They mm-hmm. don't get liberated mm-hmm. um, to, to actually go to that heaven place. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. And then on the flip side of that, we, you know, with the loss of religion and the extreme kind of um, secularization of, of our culture, in, at least in America, mm-hmm. it has produced the effect of um, a kind of 
uh, rebirth of uh, religious extremism, right? Yeah. We see that in yes. um, all kinds of churches, especially in the South, but there's a lot of really, really, really intense, heavy, culty religious fervor in this country. And it's yeah. a reaction to what is perceived as the loss of the specialness of God. Um, yep. And I think that that produces a kind of zombified state of people, you know, being yeah. it's, it's when it's not, you know, when the um, belief in, in God or something spiritual is not held in balance uh, because it's reactionary. I think that that's when we start to kind of get into trouble and again, losing consciousness to the mass of the yeah. group. So it doesn't have to just be the mass of consumers mm-hmm. and it can also be, you know, the mass of its opposite, which is something yep. spiritual. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's mass consciousness in and of itself. I think that that's really the, the whole idea of it. And we're really in that today because there's so many people <laughs> just in general and there's the internet too, which creates mass consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that in a lot of these zombie shows or the shows where they're, they're they have undead things um they tend to one of the things that they they do a lot is the living people have to be in conflict with each other too and so a lot of times there'll be small groups of people they did this a lot in the walking dead that feel very evangelical almost they're just like this is what we believe this is how we function there's no other way of functioning and then they have these ideological tensions constantly which Mm. is very interesting and it's also Mm. so shadow like it's kind of like with the with the obliteration of half the world people are able to live through their shadow they always have like some group who just murders people for fun or Mm -hmm. whatever you know there's always something like that that goes on and and so that's but that's a whole other thing but i think um i think that that's that's really we've kind of moved through this and found this this core idea that in 2023 in the last 20 years 30 years our obsession with zombies has really gone side by side with our development of of the mass consciousness that we have TV and media now and, and the internet and all these things that should allow us to have variety and to figure out our own preferences, likes, thoughts, all these things. And somehow it still limits us. Somehow we still fold in. It's not always a singular mass consciousness. Sometimes, especially in like the US, we have like a very bipolar kind of consciousness in terms of you know, we have the left and the right. And it's like, are you that? Or are you that? There's no in between. There's no this, like, there's no, there's no room for, for kind of curiosity with that. It's very rigid. And I think that that is, is an expression of the world we live in. Um, and before we kind of close out this discussion, there's um, another young quote that I want to read. And this comes from the Mysterium Conjunctionis, which I think is his last work that he ever wrote. I think so. Um, and I got this quote from the This Jungian Life podcast. They have an episode on zombies, which I highly recommend. Go listen to that. Um, and so Jung writes, the more you cling to that which all the world desires, the more you are every man, with a capital E, who has not yet discovered himself and stumbles through the world like a blind man leading the blind with somnambulistic certainty into the ditch. Every man is always a multitude Therefore, bethink you for once and consider what is behind all this desirousness, a thirsting for the eternal. Mm. So essentially what he's saying there is that the every man, it's this classic idea of the kind of archetypal person, right? The, the man that we can all identify with, the, the person we can all identify with. And so he's saying that um, the more that you cling to that the world desires, what what the world kind of forces upon you to desire, the more that we become this like nameless, generic idea of a person. And we just kind of stumble through the world like a blind man, like a sleeping man, just rocking ourselves into a ditch that has no forward momentum. But inside that person, there is a multitude. And we our task is to find that multiplicity, find those particular individual avenues of of thinking and feeling. And so he says, what is behind all this desirousness? What is behind this longing and this seeking and this wanting and this consumerism? And deep down, it's, it's a way of covering up the real thirst, which is for the eternal, which is for the spiritual. Um, And I think that that is a very, very beautiful idea. And that is what the zombie is completely denied. 
It's mm-hmm. eternal in that it doesn't, its flesh doesn't rot away. It will always be there, but it loses its eternal soul. Um, and so that is, that is what we're facing, I think, on a collective level. So it's a, it's a symbol and a metaphor to really ponder for ourselves, I think. Beautifully put. Mm-hmm. All right. Should we do a dream or a symbol yes. now? Let's do it. If you're enjoying this podcast, we encourage you to leave a review or learn more about how you can support us on Patreon, where you can get access to some exciting exclusive offerings. Or you can connect with us by sharing a symbolic experience, whether from a dream or synchronicity, for us to explore on the show. Thank you to today's sharer, and please tell us your symbolic experience or connect with us on our website, soarmysticapodcast.com. Are you a small business looking to reach a targeted audience of people interested in all things esoteric? If this sounds like you, Sora Mystica would love to invite you to become an ad partner. We offer a highly tailored audience of mindful, curious, depth-seeking listeners, and we would be delighted to showcase your business and offerings to new hearts and new minds. Simply fill out an advertiser application form at our website, linked in the show notes below, or navigate to sorormysticapodcast.com forward slash advertise with us. Are you a myth and symbol loving writer with a list of beloved stories that changed your life, but you can't finish one of your own stories to save your life? The Inspirited Word is the podcast for visionary but disenchanted creatives ready to stop second guessing their storytelling and to rediscover the deep living magic in their craft. Join writer, editor, and host Mary Lanham on your favorite pod app or at inspiritedword.com. I listen to this podcast myself and I love it. So definitely check out inspiritedword.com. On the symbolic life path, we are often looking for images to wear that speak directly to where we are. At Hawk Hummingbird Moon Studio, Don Hemstreet creates beautiful, wearable sterling silver and gemstone jewelry that speaks to your soul and your sense of artful adornment. Every piece is diligently handcrafted and designed for each individual stone, creating a story and a home for what that stone is trying to express. Dawn incorporates ancient symbols, dynamic modern shapes, and mythological themes in each artful piece. Pop over to her website, hawkhummingbirdmoon.com, to see what new works are available, and follow her on social media for updates at dawnhemstreet.jewelry on IG. Okay, so today's symbol is kind of in keeping (laughs) with Mm -hmm. our theme. Um, The symbol is just titled Dead Birds. (laughs) Um, So our listener writes in, I recently went on a vacation with my best friend at a beach in Oregon. We had four events where dead birds were seen, as well as a ball of feathers we later discovered that was the leftover skin of a bird that had become prey. The first sighting was downtown on a sidewalk where a baby bird was found on the sidewalk. My friend picked it up and moved it off the sidewalk. Um, We then came across three other dead birds on the beach, um, all three white and a bit dismembered, but all the parts close by. And then at the end, a perfectly strange ball of feathers. My friend was the one to notice and bring all of these into awareness. Frankly, I probably would have missed many of these sightings. She was very in touch with these experiences. We are curious to know more than Google can offer. (laughs) I think we both felt a bit horrified by these encounters, except the ball of feathers, which I brought home. All of the feathers were white. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's... Creepy. Very, I think it's cool. Yeah, it's it's you know, recently when when we see, I feel like when we encounter death, and it's, it's such a big thing to say. I feel like when <laughs> yeah. we encounter death in nature, I'll say mm-hmm. right, not like the loss of people that we love. Mm-hmm. It kind of tends to like come out very. It's very loud, and I don't know if it's because we don't experience the kind of primal nature of death as often, um, you know, as human beings. But recently I had this really sad experience where while I was on a walk with my partner, we found a baby possum Mm -hmm. that looked like it was just in terrible shape. And it was like big enough that it could have maybe just have fallen off its mom because at a certain mm-hmm. point they get big and they fall off and then they just, they're loners, they do their own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but we called like the little animal rescue center in town and they were like, just scoop it up and 
you know, try to get it to a rehab place. Of course, possums are considered invasive in Oregon. So Mm -hmm. nobody would take it without Mm -hmm. euthanizing it. So we tried to nurse the little thing. And unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't make it. So we had to have, you know, we had a very sweet little possum funeral. And Mm -hmm. Um, it was and it's just become most... friends with your cat. It's oh, well, that's experience. the weirdest thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, it's literally, it was like pouring rain. I think this was, a, it was in the spring. I think it was in like April or something mm-hmm. pouring rain, crying at the possum funeral in our backyard. And then after that, we went for a walk and immediately I saw a dead sparrow on the oh sidewalk. Mm. It was so weird. And so uh, I did the same thing. I picked it up and I moved it you know, under a tree and I put some flowers on it and stuff. Mm. And I was just like, why is this echoing in this way? And so I, I feel just like, it's just, you know, this indicator of death showing itself to us in this way and saying like, this is as much a part of life as it is, you know, something that we don't encounter that often. But yeah, what Marianne is talking about is that now, like I, I have two cats and one of them, is kind of like a person and the other one is kind of like a super cat spirit and he is really cute and every morning I let him outside to like go check out the yard and he just goes straight to the place where we buried the little baby possum and he Mm -hmm. rolls on the dirt there and he kind of acts like he's playing and I'm just like possum ghost is your yeah they've become friends they've become Mm -hmm. friends for sure Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, back to the birds. I'll read a little from I have a bird's entry in the symbols book. That yeah, I like. let's do it. Let's do that. Um, it is a very, very long entry. And oh, I, sure. I think that we could do a whole episode on um, the symbol of the bird. But um, here it just says the bird is transcendence, the soul, a spirit, divine manifestation, spirits of the air and spirits of the dead. Mm -hmm. Ascent to heaven, the ability to communicate with gods or enter a higher state of consciousness, thought, imagination. Large, large birds are often identified as solar. Mm -hmm. Um, Birds are a feature of tree symbolism. Mm -hmm. And so the divine power descends into the tree or onto its symbol, a pillar. And it goes on for a while. But basically, um, birds are highly magical creatures. They're representative of the element of air. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're associated with fire, like the phoenix or lightning, um, like the eagle, the bird of Zeus. Mm-hmm. And so to discover again and again dead birds in uh, this walk. And I like that it's a beach in Oregon, too. Mm-hmm. Oregon beaches are so haunted and so, spooky. So, so haunted. I have never had a, a charming experience going to the beach out here. It's like, you're here and there are ghosts. And, yes, um, it is a ghost. The whole beach is a ghost. It is. It's like very raw nature. And so at, at the coast of Oregon, you're really, you're at the edge of the United States. <laughs> There's nothing ahead, you know, or behind you except just the sea and then whatever, Oregon. And it feels really extreme. It feels mm-hmm. like a liminal place. And yeah, I've had experiences out there of seeing eagles and other strange things have happened. And um, I feel as though the re- the repetitive nature of these dead birds say, number one, some other prey animal was having a feast and that's yeah, okay because yeah, that's yeah. nature. But number two, um, the kind of symbolic weight for me is like something you're in this liminal state, you're in this liminal yeah. place. Maybe you and your friend were in a kind of deep conversation and the birds were kind of saying, you know, that they're almost like a psychopomp figure to yeah, me. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I could ramble about this for a lot longer, but what comes up for you? I think that the, the, definitely the idea of death and the, the reminder of mortality, I, I deeply appreciate that when that happens to me, when I happen upon something that has passed, it's so ridiculously sad. I don't know if I told you this. I, uh, my grandmother's birthday was recently 103 years old. (laughs) Happy birthday, grandma. Um, and her neighbor like takes care of a lot of like cats in the neighborhood Mm -hmm. they didn't intend to they just a cat came on their porch one day and they fed it and now they are the cat people of the neighborhood and they have all these cats and uh, they had this beautiful silver kitten um Mm -hmm. that got ran over like right before we came and so he had picked it up in a bag and he had it in this plastic bag and it was very very sad nightmare um but i i am grateful for those moments of reminding myself of the preciousness of life you you have 
empathy for something that is not in your very superhuman brain going, these are all the problems of my life. And then you're just like, oh, death, death is here. Death comes for all of us. There are things living beyond me that life is around me. And it kind of zooms you way out of your, of your very limited thing and says, look at all life is suffering. Mm -hmm. All life is experiencing itself. Um, and death is present all the time. And, you know, it reminds us to, to remember our own mortality and that life is precious, but also I feel like it's always an invitation to just contact that archetypal experience of death, death, and make a little bit of a, of a relationship with it, a peace with it actually. And, and to kind of remember how we are uh, a part of nature. I feel like that's a very, it's a very basic thing to say, but I I really feel like that's kind of the zoomed out thing of like, who are you? This doesn't matter, does it? Um, I I would definitely be wondering, you said you were with your friend, your friend more noticed this. So it's definitely for both of you, obviously, because your friend is noticing it and pointing it out to you. I wonder what were you talking about? Mm-hmm. when these things happened um were you talking about the same thing when these things happened was the was the conversation turning around was what was the relationship between you at the time i wonder it sounds like a shared experience so that would be my not to say that death is <laughs> coming for your relationship no, at all no, no. it's more like a bonding than anything yeah. else and it's so, kind of yeah, yeah it's like you're being you're both experiencing and encountering something that's really intense and has a lot of potency. Like if I was out on a walk with you and we found dead birds, I'd be like magic. Yeah. (laughs) It would be magic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so I think that like, you know, we often say, you know, the bird symbolism that's Googleable is Mm going to always be limited because it's really more about what do birds mean to you? It's going to say freedom. It's going to say, yeah, flying. It's going to say whatever, (laughs) levity. Um, You know, oh, I want to say too, I like that we've noted that the feathers were all white again, you know. Very angelic feeling, liminal, yeah. Totally like pure, right? But again, what does white, the color white or the experience of encountering, um, you know, yeah, just like light um, Mm -hmm. also, what does that feel like for you? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, because- we have to trust our own inner symbolic language as much as mm-hmm. um, the book of symbols or, yeah. you know, whatever Absolutely. the Google says. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's what's interesting too. I think it's in the wild unknown deck. The death card is a dead bird. Oh yeah, um, you're right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think so. And so I would say this might be an interesting time to pull out the death card and the temperance card. They're right mm-hmm. side by side in the tarot. I don't think that's accidental. Mm-hmm. So I would say maybe pull those two cards out of your deck and do a little work with them. Just question, maybe do some active imagination with those two cards um, because the death experience happens and that allows us to be guided. Then temperance guides us to, to the next thing. So that there might be something in there for you. Um, to to explore that would that would be my suggestion Mm -hmm. yeah thanks for sharing this it's a it's a sad one a little spooky mostly sad um and but deep and it has potency and I think that we all need to you know let's go into the scorpionic depths and remind ourselves we are all flesh (laughs) we are all flesh and that flesh can become zombified um (laughs) yes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> on that note um yeah well this was a really interesting provocative conversation that we've had today mm-hmm. yes thanks so much everyone and we'll see you next time mm-hmm. take care thank you for joining us in our conversation today please consider supporting the podcast by leaving a review and following soar mystica wherever you listen You can also become a more active supporter and a member of the Soror Mystica community by joining our Patreon. If you have a symbolic experience that you'd like to share with us for the podcast, you can tell us all about it at SororMysticaPodcast.com. The music for this podcast is written and performed by me, Mariana Lewis, with special thanks to Stefan Lewis. You can connect with both Christina and myself on Instagram and get to know our work by clicking on the links in the show notes. As the alchemical motto goes, as above, so below, as within, so without. May this ancient wisdom continue to guide you deeper. Until next time, take good care.